Welcome back to the final episode of CCTV at Chemcon Europe 2016 with today the Q&A on GHS, an interview on endocrine disruptors and the final coverage of our local reporter Annemarie. But first the Q&A on GHS and some sound bites of our roundtable on supply chain communication. One of the questions in the Q&A on GHS was if the use of binding tariff information is mandatory in the EU. Binding tariff information is related to the customs classification. Um, the EU change of legislation per May 1st is uh, actually a big one. Uh, today you can have a binding tariff information ruling from any of the EU member states. Um, that ruling is mandatory for the authorities to use, but you as an applicant or owner of the BTI are not forced to use it. The legislation describes that the authorities have to follow it, but only if you appeal to it. So you as an, a company are allowed to move away from it. Per May 1st, the biggest change is that you as a company are also forced to use it. Another question was if you should apply the HS code from the country of import or export. HS differences on customs classification, yeah, they are often happening and it's often indeed per request of a customer. Um, we have the policy uh, to list an HS code on our customs invoices, uh, but we clearly outline that it's the uh, HS code used from the exporting country. So if we're shipping from the Netherlands, it will state EU classification code. If then a customer wants to deviate from a classification code in the country of importation, they're free to do so as long as we're not the importer of record. In the roundtable discussion in the afternoon, the audience was asked to give examples of industry challenges in relation to the supply chain. Jim, Jim Casper from PPG Industries, so I'm part of SEPE, amongst other things. Um, supply chains are not that simple. Nope. We're a formulator, we receive mixtures, we formulate mixtures. Um, so wherever we sit in that supply chain, we're always going to be uh, having multiple roles and uh, we do not receive very many exposure scenarios for single substances and I don't think we've ever received a single one for a mixture unless it was passing on the uh, exposure scenario for, the, for one lead substance within that. So um, for us formulators it's going to take a long time before we're able to produce an exposure scenario because we're never going to receive all the information that we, re that we need in order to be able to comply if we're expected to produce exposure scenarios for mixtures. Today's interview is a hot topic, endocrine disruptors. Andy, can you clarify a little bit more for me what the difference is between endocrine activity and endocrine disruption? Um, well, very simply, if you walk out into the road in front of a car and the car sounds its horn, then you're going to get a shock of adrenaline and you're going to react. Uh, and assuming you react in time, then after a little while your body will sort of settle back down to normal and then it's a completely reversible effect. So there's been some activity in response to a stimulus, but it settles back to a normal state. Uh, this is w the whole purpose of having regulatory authorities and yeah. having regulatory requirements, is that uh, a dossier uh, of the relevant information is submitted so that the authorities can make an informed decision. Uh, that's the basis of any kind of risk assessment. What is really very important is to uh, have uh, efficient regulation. Efficient regulation means to address, to address the problem, but also to identify the right source of the problem. And this is what is lacking in the recent years. We see a lot of substance bans which are driven purely by uh, political priorities or non-substantiated uh, scientific claims. Returning to the example of uh, the sunscreen, what is the real health benefit and what is done to protect the public? This comes down to uh, what the regulatory authorities are there for. They're there to examine the information and they're there to look at the way in which the product is going to be used, uh, look at its intrinsic properties and then determine whether or not that presents an acceptable risk. Please watch the complete interview on our website and YouTube channel. And now it's time for the statement of the day. Today's statement is related to the Middle East. With us in our studio, Michael Wenk of Kumira, who is currently writing a book on the chemical control exhalation in the Middle East. Michael, welcome. Thank you. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about the trends that are currently happening in the Middle East related to chemicals? 
Roberts. Absolutely. Historically, there hasn't been much in the way of regulation in the Middle East, at least not the way we think about it compared to the EU or the US or other countries. But in the last several years, many countries have started implementing various types of legislation. So for example, Israel is putting a safety data sheet legislation into place and talking about a chemical inventory. Countries like Oman and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia are starting to regulate things like biocidal products. So historically, there hasn't been much regulation and now there's a very quick movement to various types of regulation. And your statement is? There are several key chemical regulations in the Middle East for compliance managers to be mindful of. Curious what you think about this. Michael, thank you very much for being with us this week in Amsterdam. Thank you. Time to say farewell to Annemarie. Annemarie, which final Amsterdam adventure do you like to share with us? I'd like to tell you a story about the VOC, the United East Indian Company or Dutch East Indian Company as some call it. And what better place to tell this story than on this ship? The VOC, founded in 1602, is often considered to be the first multinational corporation in the world, trading spices, tea, coffee, sugar, silk, porcelain, etc. By 1669, the VOC was the richest private company the world had ever seen. With 50,000 employees, a private army of 10,000 soldiers, 40 warships and over 150 merchant ships like the one I'm standing on right now, the Amsterdam. This ship, the Amsterdam, is a replica of the original 18th century cargo ship. When the Dutch set sail to the Far East on ships like this one, the journey took them about eight months. So, if you consider boarding such a ship and sail with it to Canada, you should be there on time for Campcom the Americas 2016 in October. From the Amsterdam, in Amsterdam, Anne-Marie for CCTV. And now it's time for the forecast of the day. Today we end with an impressive lineup, starting with authority representatives from Japan and Thailand, followed by overviews of chemical control legislation in Southeast Asia, Australia and New Zealand, then followed by Turkey, the Middle East, India, Russia and its surrounding states. With this, we only cover the morning sessions. In the afternoon, biocides and food contact, nanomaterials, endocrine disruptors, and our grand finale, a global approach to new chemicals. Thank you for watching, we hope you liked it, and we look forward to seeing you in Toronto.